we we are uh, in the process of looking at the various images of the church. Uh, the reason for doing this <clears throat> is that a metaphor, by the way, a metaphor is an assertion of, of similarity between a subject that you want to talk about and something you want to compare it to. <clears throat> you compare two things that would appear to have no particular connection, uh, but by the comparison, you're asserting that there are certain characteristics common between the two that are, as, as an expositor, it's our responsibility to find out what the comparison is and how it works. Uh, often a metaphor is strange when it is first given, uh, but then it casts great uh, light on what we are trying to talk about. So we're looking at the metaphors to try to figure out what they're telling us about the church. And I'd like to turn back uh, because I didn't do well in the, uh, in, in the treatment of the sheep and shepherd metaphor. I want to go back and I'm uh, in the PowerPoint, I'm on slide 52. So I'm going to go ahead and share this. I've got a different arrangement of my screen today than I have had. I'm not able to share yet. Brother Timothy, if you could work that out, um, uh, then I can share this, this screen with you. Still not able to share. Um, but if, if, you're, if you have your Bible there, turn to John 10. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about some, some issues in the shepherd sheep motif that bear directly on the nature of the church and especially of the local church. Um, so in John 10, verse 3, let me see if I'm able to share yet. I'm not still not able yet to share. Uh, in 10, verse 3, uh, I read uh, John 10, 3. Um, the, the gatekeeper opens to this one and the sheep of the, uh, uh, hear his voice and he calls his sheep by name. Now for Jesus, that's quite reasonable. The whole, all the sheep, all the sheep of his fold, Jesus knows, but he has, he has, access as a human to infinite knowledge and as God he he has infinite knowledge so that's great but for me as a leader of a group I can't know a thousand people <laughs> yes are you with me here yes does that make sense right so so the issue is well what who how many people can I know? And we've talked about this before, uh, but I, I will reiterate it because repetition is the mother of learning. So as I think about John 10 3 and what it says about the church, if Brother Timothy can give me the capacity to share the screen, it will help enormously. Um, uh, sociologists tell us that you can be intimately acquainted with a maximum of about 12 people. Um, you can know their names, you can know their family relationships, but you also know them well. So you can get into deep conversations with about 12 other people. That means the, the ideal size of a small group is about 13 people, so you and 12 others. Um, so in a small group, to be able to know the other person's weaknesses and strengths, to be able to talk about your own weaknesses and strengths, you have to have developed a, a, a culture of trust among the 13 people. Uh, so a maximum ideal size of a small group would be about 13 people. 
once you go beyond 13, once you reach 15, the group has begun to divide. And by the time you reach 18, it has divided. And in a group of 15 or 18, you're intimately re related to, a, to fewer people in that group than you were in a group of 13. Uh, so what you ought to do reach a group of 15 is indeed, once you reach the, the size of 13, you need to be planning for this group to grow and for it to uh, begin to divide. But this is the division of the body of Christ. This is how bodies grow. You have the same, <laughs> you are the same person that was born on your birthday. My birthday was Sunday. So 73 years ago, I came upon the face of this earth. <laughs> and I still am the same person I was then, but my body is substantially different. Because I was, I forget what mother said, I was eight pounds something, I've, I've got my birth certificate somewhere, but what, what use is it to look it up now? I was about eight pounds when I was born, and I now, I now, am substantially beyond eight pounds. <laughs> so how did I get there? I got there by the division of the cell groups. Is that true? Yeah. Then if that's true, the way the body of Christ grows is by the individual cells multiplying by division. We are not divisive. We remain a unity. The, the unity is in the body of Christ. The cells are, are intimately linked to the head. But the small groups grow by dividing. So once you reach 13, you ought to be preparing somebody to become a leader of the next cell group that's going to divide when you reach 13 or 14 or 15. Uh, I'm sorry, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18. At some point there, it will be necessary for the small group to divide. But if you're a leader, one of your functions is to start preparing the leaders who will take over the next small group. Um, this is how the church grew for the first three centuries, folks. In, in the first three centuries, there was no building dedicated to become a church. They, they met in homes, they met in businesses, they met in public spaces, but there was no building that was a church. Uh, so uh, the churches were very small. And as we pointed out earlier in the demographics of the Roman church, in the south, southwestern part of the city of Rome, the larger, the greater Rome, we might call it today, uh, the, the place where the church was, was very strong in the early years was in the southwest. And this is, the, this is where the Jewish people lived. But the largest apartment that you could imagine could only house about 15 people. Uh, most could, could do eight to 10 people. So the, the average small group, the average what we would call house church was made up of about eight to 15 people. Uh, they shared their meals together and to be cut off, 1 Corinthians 5, to be cut off from the eating together. You remember this, yes, no, it, shake your heads if you yes. remember what I'm talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. Not to even eat with such a one was to be cut off from daily food because most people lived only a day or two from famine in the first century and to, to be cut off from sharing in the, in the family bringing together the meal was to be cut off from, from nourishment because you might not have earned anything that day and you wouldn't have anything to buy food with. So the small group would be uh, about, ideally, about 13 people. You can be well acquainted with about 300. You can know their names, their family relationships. You can have a good conversation with them. You go below, below the, just, the, uh, just the greeting and 
tell me about yourself. You know about them. You know they're, who they are, where they come from, what kind of work they do. And you can have a good conversation with them, but you're not intimate with them. You don't know all their strengths and weaknesses. You don't know all of that. Uh, so what, what, what does this tell us? Well, the small groups probably came together in larger groups for what some modern theorists about the church are saying is the celebration. They would come together, a number of small groups could come together on a periodic basis, maybe every month, maybe every two or three months, they would get together for uh, just celebrating what God is doing among them or for mutual prayer and, and support uh, or to hear a specially skilled teacher come in and uh, teach about things that are of common interest to, the, to all the small groups. But you can't know more than about 300, and sociologists tell us that once you go past 300, the group is beginning to divide, and by the time you've reached 500, it has divided, and you know fewer people in a group of 500 than you knew in a group of 300. So the, the maximum size of a, a regional church would be about 300. So I'm, I'm arguing that there are different levels for the church. There is the body of Christ, the church universal, which is today both in heaven and on earth. And that body of Christ uh, is known to Jesus, it's just not known to us. And so when I come to India, um, I, I meet the body of Christ there already prepared and I come to serve the body of Christ. Uh, and we, we recognize our unity and we share that unity among ourselves as we engage in the fellowship that we, we have. But I can't know you well because <laughs> I live so far away from where you are that I uh, just can't get to know you well. Um, some of you I know better than others. So there's the universal body of Christ. There is the celebration. This is the gathering of multiple smaller groups for um, observing the whole work of God in a region. Then there is the there are the local groups, what I call the regional church, and then there is the there in, then there is the the house church. I would argue, brothers and sisters, uh, especially since you're in India, this will be true. Your family is larger than your nuclear family by, by a substantial margin. Is that true for most of you? Move your heads. Those of you who, whose faces I can see, I see pictures of some of you. I don't see videos of, of some of you, but... Uh, Dr. Uh, Alvin, you can you can use the PowerPoint if you need. Oh, I can now. All right, I, I'll get there shortly. Thank you, brother. Um, so so your nuclear family, the father, mother, the children, get together every day. Uh, maybe the brothers and sisters get together on on a somewhat more less frequent basis, but when the whole family gets together, there may be uh, tens or 50s or hundreds of you that gather. Is, that, is this true? Yes. Yes, but you don't do that every day. And yes. you don't do it every week. Mm -hmm. You don't even necessarily do it every month. You might do it every month because somebody's having a birthday somewhere in that period and it, it, it's appropriate to, gather, to get together and celebrate. But uh, if you think in those terms, the... the uh, the family that we are is a family where we know the names. So back to John 10, 3, um, and let me put it now on the screen for you. And I want to share um, the uh, uh, PowerPoint here. So, oh, fish feathers, now I've lost 
Fish feathers is a wonderful swear word because there is no such thing as fish feathers in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. And so this is my swear word. Um, let me see here how I may make this work for me better. Ah. Now it can work better. Okay, you're seeing the PowerPoint, yes? Is this true? I, I, yes. I, I trust, I trust, all right. The sheep hear his voice and he calls them, he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought the, all of his own out, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. So one aspect of local church that we've got to take account of is if you can't know the names, it can't be a church. One of the implications of this, brothers and sisters, is that for the, for the most intimate form of the church, the most intimate form cannot grow larger than 13. At the second level, so that would be the house church, at the second level is the local church, which cannot grow larger than 300, because no one can know the names of more than about 300 people and be able to carry out a conversation with them. Am I making sense? Yeah. I attended a church in Dallas that had a, an auditorium that would seat 3,400 people. For Dallas, that was not a mega church. Uh, there was a mega church not far, about seven miles from us. And that mega church had a 7,000 seat auditorium and they had three to four services every Sunday. I propose to you that the pastor of that church was no shepherd at all because he did not know and could not know the names of the people that he, pur he purports to shepherd. He was no shepherd at all for the shepherd knows his sheep by name and he can call them by name. So if he had, they, they had 20,000 pe 20, people in attendance on a given Sunday morning Brothers and sisters, that was no church. That was no church. It was a small denomination. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it, it had stolen the name church from the scriptures, purporting that it was a church, but it was no church at all. And he was no pastor. My own pastor was a very famous man there in Dallas and around the world. My own pastor walked up to me. I was standing in the aisle before the service began one Sunday morning. I was waiting for my wife to come sit. Uh, I, Because I read in Greek and Hebrew at church, I don't want people uh, looking over my shoulder and saying, what is that? And so, so I don't want to show that off. It's, it's for myself. It's, no, it's not for anybody else. But as I was waiting for her, I had my Greek Bible and my Hebrew Bible and my wife's Bible and my computer with me because I was teaching a Sunday school class at that church. Um, Sunday school is for everyone at, in, in America, not just for children. And he knew a Greek Bible and a Hebrew Bible. He knew what they looked like. And he said, oh, I'm so glad you brought your Bibles. Uh, glad you're here today. And he walked by and went on. And I thought, you don't even know who I am. And he hired me to teach at Dallas Seminary. He interviewed me at Dallas Seminary. He was no pastor at all. He was a preacher, but he was no pastor at all. Brothers and sisters, if we aspire to be biblical and not just famous, if we aspire to be biblical, we got to take account of a verse like John chapter 10, verse 3, but also verse 11, 
the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That pastor could not lay down his life for the 3,000. There never were 3,000 people in the auditorium. But for the 2,800 when it was full, he never could lay down his life for the sheep. He would say, well, I lay down my, my life for the sheep by studying and, pre and preparing well for my sermon. <coughs> but when I, when I joined the church there as a, as a Bible teacher, the, the staff member who, who brought me on as a Bible teacher said, uh, if, if you have to go to the hospital, you must not expect the pastor to come visit you at the hospital. He said, if I get laid up in the hospital, he will not, I don't expect him to come visit me. What kind of shepherd is that? Brothers and sisters, this is no shepherd at all. Well, what is a, what is a church then? A church is a group of people whom Jesus here calls sheep. Brother, then, yes. there was some interruption. So can you repeat the statement again? How far back? Just a, one, one minute back. Okay. I'm not sure what I was saying one minute back. <laughs> uh, uh, the pastor, the, 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 the staff member who, who yeah, brought me on, right. the staff member who brought me on to teach mm -hmm. at that church told me, he said, if you get sick and are in the hospital, you must not expect the pastor to come and visit you. He said, if I get sick and go to the hospital, I don't expect the pastor to come visit me. It's going to be somebody else on the staff. Well, brothers and sisters, that's no shepherd at all. The shepherd okay. is the one who looks out for the well-being of the sheep. So, brothers and sisters, let's get past this folly of Western church culture that a church of 3,000, 4,000, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 20,000 is no church at all. Let's get over that and let's go back to what the Bible teaches and observe that the local church, the smallest form of the church would be about 13 people. That's ideal. When it reaches 15 to 18, it's dividing and we prepare for it divide by starting to train leadership. The largest form of the local church would be about 300. And those who are leaders should be preparing the church for division by planning and preparing new leaders who will take over if, if the church is practicing the love that the body of Christ ought to practice do you notice that we are talking in John 10 right now, John 13, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you have love for one another. So where love is, that group where love is practiced is attractive to people who don't know love. When they see real love, it's attractive. So it should grow by the sheer attractiveness of the love that we practice for one another for the leaders laying down their lives, not sacrificing the sheep to feed their bellies, but feeding the sheep so that the sheep love one another. That's attractive. And we're preparing for the group to, to divide like your body has divided. It's not divisive, but it grew by division. It grew and pr produced a greater unity than it had. So in John 10, 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrifices his own well-being for the good of the sheep. And verse 14, I know my own and my own know me. Furthermore, in, in verse, um, uh, well, let me go on here. Uh, so, so we've been talking about the implications of leadership and the implications for church size right through our, our session so far as we've gone this morning, the, or this evening for you, the issues for us are that a mega church is no church at all. Let us get over that. Let's cast this, this off. 
as a as a, a business marketing view of the church, not a biblical view of the church. We are not trying to become a bloated sheep, which is, uh, or a bloated flock, which is unmanageable, which the shepherd cannot know. And let's get to a biblical standard of what the church is. Now, in our discussions, uh, John 21, 15 to 17, here Jesus calls Peter to shepherd the sheep. There are a few observations that we might, we might draw from this. Shepherding occurs as a result of the disciples' love for Jesus. Shepherding occurs to Jesus' lambs and sheep. And shepherding consists of two primary functions, to provide for them, provide them adequate pasture, and to take care of them, uh, of what other needs may be involved, according to, um, I'm not sure what 2310 refers to here, uh, the emphasis in this word may be on feeding the sheep, feeding the animals. Uh, the herd and flock uh, we are to herd and tend the flocks of sheep or goats, and we may also add the need for protecting the flock against predators. So, oh, this is, this is uh, Acts 20, 28 and following. We may also add the need for protecting the flock and, uh, against predators, internal and external. And I point out to you in Acts 20, 28, 29, and 30, Paul says, even from your own number, um, ravening wolves will arise, not sparing the flock. So we must protect the, the, the sheep against <laughs> external enemies, predators in the culture, persecution. But we must, and, and that may mean laying down our life for the sheep by taking uh, execution ourselves, persecution ourselves, and protecting the sheep. But also we must lay down our lives by getting rid of elders who become predators, and elders do become predators. Timothy, Paul gives us in Timothy standards for how you deal with an elder, but an elder gives up the right of private rebuke in sin. Brothers and sisters, he must be rebuked before all, and we don't do this. We protect the elders against the sheep instead of protecting the sheep against the elders. Uh, so Acts 20, 28 to 31, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. I, I have here on this, on this slide uh, the issue of the word pastor. The word pastor occurs in all of my translations only in one plan. And, and I have 25 or 30 translations in my Logos software. In all of them, the word pastor occurs in only one verse in all the Bible, and that's in Ephesians 4.11. I wonder why. I wonder if that's not our cultural bias, that there is an office of pastor, and not simply a gift of pastoring, and that gift of pastoring is actually a gift, not of pastoring, but of shepherding. Are you with me? And if that's the case, there are only two offices in the church, elders and deacons. The elders, Acts 20, 28, are called to do shepherding, but they are not necessarily gifted with shepherding. In 1 Timothy, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the elders are to be apt to teach. That doesn't mean that they have the gift of teaching. It means they have the responsibility of teaching. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, I keep getting these calls about people who are worried about my car, and they want to make sure that my car warranty doesn't run out, and they want me to, they want to help me by letting me spend some more money, so I just delay <laughs> them and put this all away. First, First Peter 5, 2 to 4 is another passage uh, that is important in all of these. First Peter 5, 2. I'm turning there. I want you to turn there as well. Um, 
you probably know it better than I do, but let me point out some things that you may have missed. Uh, so he instructs as an, as an older elder, <laughs> uh, to the elders, I exhort the one who am a fellow elder um, and a partaker of the, uh, uh, of the uh, witness of the sufferings of Christ. Verse 2, shepherd the flock that is among you, the flock of God that is among you, uh, watching out, that, seeing to it that you don't do it out of necessity, but willingly in a godly way, not for, for shameful gain, but um, zealously not lording it over, the, over the, the heritage of God, but being examples of the flock. And I, I'm going to stop there. Folks, you as leaders are the servants of the servants of the Most High God. You are not there to um, beat the sheep or to lord it over the sheep. You must not become people who are so avid for money that you look for a larger flock so that they will give you more money. You must learn to trust the Lord for the provision and let, let the flock have the food. Um, so they are, uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 instructs the church to contribute to the elders and to, and to uh, the, the double honor in 1 Timothy 5.17 entails the notion, as far as I can understand it, uh, entails the notion that the, uh, the church is to reimburse the elders in terms of the time spent that they would have, what they would have earned if they had been working at their trade. The reason I take that view is the similar notion, kind of opposite notion, in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, uh, verse 2, verse 3, um, and say unto her that, that they have received a double, a double portion for all their sins. Surely that verse of 40, verse 2 cannot be saying that God has punished Israel twice as much as their sins deserve. That would be unjust. So the, the, Im the imagery, I think, must be the double is, is and I'm, I'm going to come back to, uh, I quit sharing here, and I can't figure out how to quit sharing at this point. So I, I can't do it. But if you hold one hand up and put the other hand up against it, the one hand is the double of the first hand. Yes? Does that make sense to you? Move your heads. Yes, thank you. So the, the penalty for their sins exactly matches the nature of the sin that's been committed in Isaiah 40. And I think that must surely be the point if the elder is a potter and might have earned a denarius. There it is. There's, there's the... Uh, uh, sharing uh, function for me. Let me go to the, uh, I guess this is the best I can do right now. Uh, I hold up one hand, I got the other hand up to it. One is the double of the other. So if the elder is a, is a potter, what he would earn for the day as a potter is what the church ought to remunerate when the, when the potter elder must take the day off from his pottery to do the ministry that's necessary for the church. So the, the church must put together the, uh, uh, the coins necessary to help that elder live so, so that the useful ministry can continue. So back to uh, our, our uh, PowerPoint. We talked about the vine and the branches two weeks ago when we were last together, we had come to the, uh, the cornerstone and the stones for the building and the temple of God. We talked about that in some measure. <clears throat> Can you see the PowerPoint where it's legible? Are, are you able to read that in this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. 
Good, I will, I'll make it a little larger so that you can see it even better perhaps. Um, Well, it's as big as it will get. No, it's not quite there. We now we have it more or less. Um, these are the general passages of scripture where this uh, concept occurs. Um, and uh, they're all worth study. All I can do is point you to them at this point because I must move on to some other material. Um, since we missed last week, I'm not going to belabor you to impose upon you for an extra week unless this is what you want. Uh, so we will we will uh, plan to move on to uh, our final studies in uh, uh, our following weeks here. But First uh, Peter two five, um, we talked about two weeks ago. We are the temple of God. And as such, brothers and sisters, when you come to the temple, when you gather as the church, whether it is 13 people or 300 people, when you gather as the church, you are coming before the temple of God. I was in Jerusalem five times in 1997 to 99. And um, four of those times we went up on the Temple Mount. It always was so meaningful to me to go up there, even though the Dome of the Rock is there with the blasphemy of Jesus um, that is inscribed inside the dome. Um, I was so intrigued to be up there because that's the last place before the incarnation, that's the last place where we know that the glory of God dwelt upon earth um, before the incarnation. And I just felt that I was coming to a holy place and I wanted to treat it with honor because this is a place where God had revealed himself in unique ways. Psalm, uh, Psalm 63, verse two, David says, I beheld you in the temple. Um, well, David had never been to the temple, and there are, there are lots of issues that, that we would need to spell out to give a full explanation of it. But when he went to the tabernacle, he saw the revelation of the glory of God, brothers and sisters. Well, you coming before those people are coming before the temple. You must treat them with that kind of honor. Too much have we seen the so-called clergy, by the way, in 1 Peter 2, the heritage of God that I read there just a moment ago is the word from which we get the word clergy. This is not the leadership. It's the people. The people are the clergy. We are the servants of the clergy, brothers and sisters. Let's get over this. Let's get our, our language back to biblical standards. I'm wearing myself out here. <laughs> Please pray for my strength. Uh, uh, but we are coming before the clergy. We're coming before the temple. Th these are the people in whom the glory of God dwells, through whom the, the glory of God is revealed in this earth. You will say, ah, but they are so immature. I will say, ah, but got there indwelt by the, the triune God. You will say, ah, but they don't understand much. I will say, ah, but they are indwelt by the triune God. And you must, you must come to understand that you are not bringing God to the people. You are coming before God's presence in the people. You must treat them with that kind of dignity. This is, this is what it means to serve the temple of God. Um, there, there, is, there is more that we might say I, I must move on here. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 14, 25, the church is a peculiar place for revealing the glory of the God who dwells in it. Um, the church is the peculiar place for man to commune with God. 
So Matthew 18, 20, fellowshipping with other believers is fellowshipping with Christ. When we speak to others, we must speak as it were the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 11. Why must we speak as it were the oracles of God? Because we're standing in the presence of God, no flippancy, no foolishness, treating them with honor, because this is who they are, brothers and sisters. That's not who you are. That's who the body of Christ is. And as a servant of that body of Christ, you must treat it with its proper honor. We bring one another speech marked by grace, seasoned with salt, Colossians 4, 6. So we have a, we have a saying in, in, in English, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can put salt in his feed to make him thirsty. <laughs> so we must make the people thirsty for more feeding from, from the Spirit of God. So our, so our very language must be marked by grace as we address them. We must not lord it over the flock, but we must treat them with the honor that they are due because they are the temple of God. And finally, we, we address the lost in place of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, and 20. Here, Paul is probably talking about his own ministry as an apostle, but if, it's, if it is necessary for an apostle to, uh, to address the people in the place of God, then you are coming in the place of God as well, addressing the people, not as an apostle, but as a minister of the Word of God. You must address them with with all the, all the dignity and the seriousness that anyone who ever bore the word of God gave to that ministry. Prayer but demonstrates the nature of the church. We just, folk, we just passed that by last time when we were together. The language of worship, our worship, brothers and sisters, is not in the gathering. It's in the scattering of the church. I can only spend this much time with this. There's much else to be said here. Worship in spirit and in truth. Brothers and sisters, John 4, 20 to 24 is so important, yet we have ignored it for centuries. Uh, we have brought the worship of Jer uh, Jerusalem and Gerizim to the church instead of br bringing the worship that is in spirit and truth. I point out to you that John 4 follows John 3, and since it follows John 3, what if worship is only something that can be done by those who are born again? Can lost people sing the songs of the church uh, in a way that's impressive and moving? And the answer, brothers and sisters, is yes. They do it all the time. Can lost people pray? You will say, ah, but God doesn't hear the, the prayers of the lost. <laughs> That's not my point. Can they pray moving prayers? And the answer is yes. They do it all the time. In fact, it's not even biblical that God doesn't hear the prayers of the lost. Because John's, uh, Psalm 78, the, the, the evil in Israel prayed for bread, and God granted the prayer. So quit saying that, the, that God doesn't hear the, the prayers of the lost. Uh, can the lost preach the gospel and lead people to salvation? Yes, because the power is not in the preacher, it's in the word. And if the lost preacher is giving a sound gospel, it can lead people to salvation. So praying and preaching and singing are not worship, because they do not depend on spiritual birth. So what if, what if worship in spirit and in truth depends upon new birth and cannot be done without new birth? Then praying and preaching and, and, and singing are not the essence of worship. Then what is? Well, go find out, brothers and sisters. And furthermore, what does it mean to worship in truth? Well, what if, since this is John 4, what if John 1 comes before that, and in verse 17, Jesus says, 
the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Is there no truth in the law? Well, of course there's truth in the law. How can you know this? Because the law is given by God. So it's true, but not in the way Jesus is true. Well, what's different between the law and what is in Jesus? In John 6, he gives us the answer. In John 6, um, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Was the manna in the wilderness false? Well, the answer must be no, because the manna was given by God. So it's not true as opposed to false. It's complete as opposed to what's incomplete. The manna saved them from death by starvation, but it gave them no eternal life. The food that Jesus will give, if one eats of it, he will live forever. Yes or no? Then what is true is the fullness of the revelation of God's saving purpose in Jesus. Uh, there's a, there's a well-known man here in the United States. I, I don't know that he's known well outside. Uh, his name is Steve Brown. He's not universally liked, but I think he's a, a great teacher and, and is teaching the truth. Uh, he really understands the grace of God. But for many years, he taught preaching. And when a young man in a seminary would get up in a preaching class and preach a sermon, a doc, a Dr. Brown would say, Young man, that sermon was a great sermon. Boy, what a good sermon that was. And any synagogue in town would have loved it. What he was saying is, you told us what would pass as good teaching in Israel, but you didn't bring anything about the work of Jesus into it. <laughs> Nothing of the full purpose of the, of the uh, a full revelation of the saving purpose of God in Jesus. So true worship depends, I would argue, depends upon new birth and is expressed when the full uh, revelation of the saving purpose of God is encountered via what is given to us in Jesus. So when I teach the Old Testament, I must teach, okay, what does this mean for us as Christians? How does this bear upon us as Christians? What does the New Testament do to this application? So worship in spirit and truth. This is all I can do in our present study uh, in dealing with that idea. I must move beyond it to the priesthood. We have about uh, 25 minutes left, according to my watch. Every man believes his own watch. And so <laughs> I I'm going to believe my watch right now that we have 25 minutes left, but the priesthood. So what are we to say about the priesthood? We began to talk about it in, in, the, old, in the previous session that we had. Priesthood is chosen by God. Priesthood has an ordination with a, with a ritual of ordination, the washing of the whole body, the, the, the robing, the anointing with oil and a, and a threefold sacrifice. There is the sin offering. Would much be much better be called a purification offering than the burnt offering, uh, which is a ram making atonement. And third, the burnt offering, another ram, which is the sacrifice of ordination, purifying the priesthood for their ministry. And I, I should add here that we have this same kind of thing happening for us. We have been chosen by God. We therefore are a priesthood. There is an ordination ritual. We, have, we are engaging in that, Ephesians says, with the washing of water by the word. <laughs> uh, there is a robing. We are, we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. There is the anointing oil. We have, uh, 1 John chapter 2 says, we all have the anointing. There is the threefold sacrifice, all made all at once in Jesus, who is the purification offering, Hebrews chapter 9. He is also the, uh, the atoning sacrifice, Romans chapter 3. And he is the ordination sacrifice, 
that makes it possible for us to serve as the priesthood. Uh, the priesthood is appointed by God. They could be priests because of descent from Aaron. Holiness was there so, so as not to defile the name of their God, but holiness was not a, a matter of morality. <laughs> uh, um, who were the sons of, of, of Eli? I can't come up with their names. Um, help me out. Hophni and Phineas. Hophni and Phineas, yes. Uh, Hophni and Phineas were priests. They were holy, but in English and America, we would call them holy terrors. <laughs> they, they were holy in that they were set apart for the service and worship of God, but they were not moral. They were profoundly immoral. So they were holy and immoral. How, how can this be? Because holiness for the Levitical priesthood was a matter primarily of, of ritual purity, not of moral purity. Uh, uh, so they were not to marry a, a prostitute or a divorced woman. Uh, by the way, the, the elders are uh, prohibited from doing such things as well. There is no de a physical defect in them. Uh, Leviticus 21 gives the qualifications, physical qualifications for the priesthood. It also gives the physical qualifications for the sacrifices. They are identical. There are no moral or intellectual or spiritual qualifications for the priesthood. There are only physical qualifications for the priesthood as there are no moral, moral or spiritual or intellectual qualifications for the sacrifices. They are all dumb oxen. So, so you could have a dumb ox as a priest because there are no moral, spiritual, or intellectual qualifications for a priest. They, they must have no physical defect, just like a, the, the sacrifice to be offered on the altar. And they must not use alcoholic beverages while on duty. So, so I may add that the, pre, the, the, the elder must not be given to strong drink uh, in that regard. But the elders are not our priesthood. When I come to the New Testament, and I'm going to run past this, you can look at it uh, later on if you're inclined to. And I, I would encourage you to do this because the New Testament calls us a priesthood. And since it calls us a priesthood, we must, we must learn what our priestly responsibilities are and what, what our tasks are. We must filter them through the New Testament and not go back to the old as the Roman Catholic Church has done. And to some extent, the Anglican Church has done. We must, we must go to the New Testament to see what the priesthood that we have is to be like. The New Testament priesthood, you yourselves like living stones. Get the whole screen. There we go are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are a priesthood. I, have, I said to you two weeks ago, no one of you is a priest. I am not a priest. I never will be a priest. But all of us together are a priesthood. So when I am in India, you are my priesthood. And for each one of you, we are your priesthood. Um, um, we, have, we have gone through the sanctification, the washing, of, uh, and, and we've, we've referred to these things already. So there's a robing, there's an anointing. The service of sacrifice, 1 Peter 2.5 is a statement that we have a ritual of sacrifice to offer, Philippians 4.18. Part of that ritual is contributing to missionaries, which is a, a sweet savor sacrifice. This is, this is a, uh, a minka, I'm sorry, this is a tribute offering. Uh, the memorial portion, which is burned on the altar, is exactly what uh, 
Paul, uh, uh, Peter refers to in Acts chapter 10 when he goes to Cornelius's house. I'm sorry, when the angel comes to Cornelius, your prayers have come up as a, a memorial portion, the handful of the, of, the, of the grain offering that is offered on the altar. Romans 15, 16, the Gentiles are a priestly offering to God for, from the hands of Paul. And we may say from Romans 15 that, that evangelism is part of our sacrificial ritual, but to broaden it out beyond the apostolic context in which Peter uh, Paul is speaking here in Romans 15, all of your spiritual gifting as you practice your spiritual gifting in the body of Christ is your, um, where is it, Romans 15, is a priestly suffer, uh, offering to God. So in your ministry, see, brothers and sisters, you cannot practice spiritual gifting without new birth. So this makes it our worship. But you don't normally expect in the gathering of the assembly on Sunday in a thousand people who have gathered, I don't imagine any of you attend such a comfort, uh, congregation, but that's, that's at least a possibility. And it's an aspiration for many in America, and it's an aspiration for many in India. You can't practice your spiritual gifting there. They don't want you to because they have the order of service already set. The Holy Spirit set that uh, decades ago when the order of service was put into place. And nobody is supposed to get up and do anything in the church except what those who are on the program are supposed to do. Well, this is no spiritual worship to God. I haven't been to church in decades, brothers and sisters, only sporadically. Uh, Hebrews 13, 10 to 16 uh, is an important passage to look at. We'll run past it here. The Thanksgiving offering, and you can go through this. Our bodies, Romans 12, 1, are, are a spiritual offering. Oh, oh, by the way, Hebrews 13, 10 to 16 are spelled out here. The thank offering, that is the sacrifice of praise, this phrase, which is badly transliterated here into English, uh, Thusia Ineseos, is a sacrifice of praise. Leviticus 7.14 is, is this precise point, but it is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And furthermore, Hebrews 13.10 to 16, doing good and sharing are sacrifices which God, with, with which God is well pleased. This doesn't give us all the privilege of wearing nice robes and being honored in the community as distinctively priests that go to the altar and do things that only priests may do. But it is the distinction before God, brothers and sisters, and if you're not happy with God's honor, then why would you want the honor of the, of the congregation? Romans 12.1 serve each other in our spiritual gifting, Romans 12, 3 to 8. These are all the acceptable sacrifices to God that we do as we love one another without hypocrisy in Romans 12, 9 to 13, 10, and accept others who differ with us as Christ accepted us in Romans 14, 15, 1 to 15, 13. These are our sacrificial rituals. They don't put us on a pedestal. They don't get us honor in the, in the community. But they are honor before God. And you have to decide fairly soon. If, you've been, if, if you find this to be the teaching of the word of God, if you don't, by the way, notice that we are not Israel. Israel has a priesthood. The church is a priesthood. So if we are a priesthood, not we don't have a priesthood, then you're going to have to decide whether you want to be Israel and have a priesthood up there lording it over you, or whether you want to be a priesthood and be the body of Christ, living out the imagery of the priesthood. Our ordination sacrifices are spelled out here, the service of proclamation, much more here that we could go into. Now, I'm weary enough, and we have about six or seven minutes left, that I'm going to stop. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask?
I have harangued you and I've, I'm, I've about used up all my energies. I, by the way, walked 4.8 uh, kilometers this morning. Uh, and so that also has, has made me a little less uh, uh, alert. It should have stirred up the blood, but it stirred up weariness. So uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, please uh, feel free to ask if you have any questions or uh, else you can also use the chat box to post your questions. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Alvin, for the thank you. wonderful insights. And the Bluetooth I've been using was um, the same thing that I got a, received a call immediately. And uh, uh, that's why I lost you for a few minutes in the ah. beginning of the session. I'm sorry for that. Um, no, 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 no problem. Yeah, friends. Uh, yeah, the time is yours. Uh, let's try to uh, ask questions around at least ecclesiology uh, or around church practices. I think we have heard some uh, very, very important points that go against uh, uh, what we are actually aspiring as uh, ministers today. Uh, Probably it's kind of uh, uh, shocking to some, uh, but for others, uh, maybe it is an affirmation that the church should be like this. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to interact and we have more time for interaction as Dr. Alvin already said. And, uh, and let's try to be quick and we'll give, uh, maybe Dr. Alvin also needs a um, little bit of rest. So let's uh, try to be quick. Brother, I would like to thank you for your excellent exposition, brother. Thank you, brother. And uh, bringing forth two very important, vital things, comparing the temple and the church, which is very important, and, mm -hmm. and the role yes. that the priest plays, the pastor, the shepherd plays, the, and the shepherd who... who Accountable to the chief brother. Sorry, we are losing your voice uh, probably because and, of. Uh, and uh, also would like signal. to thank you. Are you able to hear me now? Better. This statement is good. Are you able to hear? Okay. Yes. Yes. And, and now, now thing, yes. Yeah. Second thing that I really want <laughs> Brother, sorry, uh, uh, I think you, you type it. Maybe okay, you okay, I'll do that. In the chat, but sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think the first one was mostly the appreciation, so you don't. Yes. Uh, uh, if there is a question, we'll pick it up from the chat box, but. Uh, there is uh, something asked by uh, R.K. Yeah, he says, uh, you mentioned that uh, if the congregation is about 300 members, it, it cannot be considered as a church. Uh, oh, no, no, that's you... not what I said. <laughs> no. Yeah, go ahead. Was yeah, there more so to the question? I, I think it's more of a sarcastic question than a, qu a question I would say. Uh, <laughs> okay. So they were saying if it is not a church, then what should we call that gathering? I, I would call it a, a regional church. <laughs> um, there are a few places in the New Testament, where, and I should have them at hand. I don't have the, the references. But there are a few places where Paul can talk about the church at Thessalonica or the church at Ephesus. Uh, in fact, he calls together the church, the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts 20. Um, so is there just one congregation or are there multiple congregations since all Asia heard all the whole province heard the gospel while he was there in Ephesus? I think it, it would be, there's such a large group of people that they would normally meet on a, on a house church level, but periodically they would meet on the larger level, but it's all the church. 
Wow. Yes. Uh, so the same person is asking, is there a difference between priest and pastor? Um, <laughs> a priest is what the body of Christ is. The church doesn't have a priest. It is a priesthood. The church doesn't have a pastor either. It has the gift of shepherding. Wow. I have a question. Uh, brother, uh, there is Brother Anthony who raised his hand. Probably he wants to ask a question okay. after that. The next uh, person can ask. So please go ahead, Brother Anthony, if you have any question that you want to ask. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Good morning. Alma. Good evening to you. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is straight away. Uh, there is a tent started in India. Some people sitting in one place and telecasting uh, and uh -huh. saying, I think probably might have heard about it this uh, uh, earlier also. Can yes. we, I don't know what type of church we should call it. <laughs> A COVID church. <laughs> COVID church. Well, yeah. Uh, it, it's now not safe for, for uh, these large gatherings. And so uh, doing, these, doing these things is necessary. What we probably must do, though, in the process of having these uh, online services is to assure the people the body of Christ must come together. The body of Christ must come together. The body of Christ must come together. And so um, uh, if we are separate in our own homes because of physical necessity, that's one thing. But if we're separate in our own homes because of convenience, then we're not, the, we're not acting like the body of Christ. So um, here we're doing it to protect one another in COVID. But um, I, the church I attend has started uh open meetings now at home at, at the at the, the at the uh, facility but people are still attending online some of them of necessity because of age uh because of of infirmity but 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 many of them some of them at least are doing it because of convenience and that's just not church but actually, brother, what brother Anthony is asking, I think, okay. is about uh, some people, they are staying in a big city and speaking, at a, they're giving message, which is telecast to small, small groups in different places. Yes. So yeah. The past yeah, is that's... not because of COVID, but yes. this has become a fashion. Yes. Uh, because this man, uh, he thinks that he's a big man. He no. doesn't sit in a small uh, town. He goes to a big city yes. and he speaks from there yes. uh, on a common plan, this thing. So people sitting in the different places, uh, small towns, they'll, they'll watch him on the screen. So all these groups which are did, and, you know, scattered in different places are expected to be a church. That's what I think he means, uh, Anthony means. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, the issue there, I teach a course that has, uh, uh, with Dallas Seminary, I'm responsible for a course that has 100, and, 100 plus people in it. One of the members of the class is in Afghanistan. There are those who live in Australia and New Zealand. I call that a class, but I don't call it a church. It's not a church. We're not fellowshipping. We're not sharing life together. Okay. So where there is no shared life, there is no church. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And one more question, if you don't mind. And uh, nowadays we are uh, gathering uh, uh, just like virtual, uh, uh, we, are, we are having virtual meetings on yes. Sundays. And uh, is it right or wrong to break the bread uh, and <laughs> wine uh, in, in, their own, in their own homes? People are, families are gathering in their homes. And is, is it, uh, can we do it or not? Did you uh, get my point? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. First thing is, if there are no pastors, um, then who's ordained, who's qualified to do it? 
Well, you would say, okay, but there are elders. All right, all right, that's fine. But where in the scriptures does it say that the elders must serve the, the elements of the Lord's Supper? Yeah, where, Lord's does, Supper. where is any teaching about how the specific method of doing the Lord's Supper is to be carried out? Well, there isn't any. Um, it appears to be uh, when they shared food together, Acts chapter 2. So if that's, so who, who breaks the bread at the beginning of a meal? Well, it's the father in that culture. So whoever is there starts it. And that's, it's a, it's a family thing. When the, fa when the family of brothers and sisters gets together, then the family does the Lord's Supper. Uh, and if that's, my wife and me sitting at home because of COVID, because we're elderly now, and, and we have to be more careful about these things. Uh, so if that's what we're doing, then we can have the Lord's Supper. Um, if, if it's my children are gathered with us and we want to have the Lord's Supper, we have the Lord's Supper. I, I don't see any, any restrictions. This is something the church has imposed. It's not in scripture, brother. You can't find a place where it's in scripture. I've studied the Lord's Supper uh, a lot. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, I got it. Yes, sir. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this will definitely raise people's eyebrows now. Yes, it will. Uh, I'll, I'll let the people keep thinking about it. Brother Rajesh, please go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Alman. Uh, yes. During the course of your uh, uh, explanation you have mentioned that people are the clergy and we are the servants of God and his yes. people yes that's a great and eye opener oh. and uh, in a nutshell that the truth of the church is revealed now in fact it's not being followed no people are saying we are God's servants but they are not uh, uh, serving the people of God in the way it is asked to be. So can you show some light on that? Uh, people are the clergy and we are the servants of God. Yeah. Well, I think you've said it as well as I can, I can do. I don't know that I can improve on what you've just said. Um, <laughs> we've got to rethink altogether what leadership is. I remind you, um, We've said this before, but I remind you of what Jesus said. He who would be first of knowing you must be servant of all. So if, yeah. if I'm coming in as, uh, um, in fact, Jesus says this, doesn't he? You call me, um, what does he call, uh, what does he say? Master and, and, and something else. I can't remember what he called it. Uh, you call me master, and, and it, it's well that you do so, for I am. But I am among you as one who is a servant. Uh, so that is the pattern. Jesus' pattern of leadership is the pattern we must follow. He laid down his life for the sheep. We must lay our, our lives down for the sheep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, somebody was asking about... Uh, the importance of dressing and uh, the pastor. Of, of what? Is there a message? Dressing. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Wear uh, clothes. Uh, is there a uh, special way that the pastor should be dressing? Or? If I'm coming to the temple of God, how shall I dress? If you were, if you were going to Jerusalem, in the day, if you were an Israelite, if you were a Levite, and you were going to the temple of God, you were going to serve in the temple of God, how would you dress? In your work clothes, going out in, into your garden to, to, to prune the vines and, and uh, pick tomatoes? How would you dress? Well, how should we dress when we come before the temple of God? I ought to honor the people by my dress. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Brother, uh, not, I'm sorry, Brother Sukuma. 
uh, I think Pastor Sukumar has been Good. a fan. Yeah. I let he's he's yeah, been trying it. to ask for quite a while. So <laughs> that's true. Uh, for some reason, I kept missing him, but now he got into <laughs> yes, my way of doing things and he raised his hand. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So, yeah, Thank so you, better. Doctor, yeah. for your insights this evening. Uh, as you mentioned from John 10, uh, when you uh, told us that uh, a shepherd, a pastor needs to know the name of the flock, and then uh, you turned uh, our attention to John 10, 3, uh, where, uh, I mean, the imagery there is obviously a sheep and a shepherd, and, uh, you know, when obviously we don't you know that uh, she doesn't have name and uh, the name that i probably remember is onoma i mean like something referring character something like a physical attributes of a person or something so, something on similar lines like that but then you know so it's uh, more than a name uh, it's a relationship like you saying shared life uh, mm -hmm. where we know each other deeply uh, <laughs> you know that's how and then um, um, fantastic to know that uh, you know you put that in a, a very beautiful uh, image. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it means a lot coming from one who is specifically in pastoral work. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh... <laughs> Well, I was just wondering, uh, uh, yeah, there is little that we can glean from the scripture as, as to the practice of distribution of the elements for sure. But is there a danger uh, when we just let it loose and um, say, have it anywhere, anywhere you want? Uh, I'm more concerned about the reverence that people would have for it. And well, be, because we have been using it in a setup uh, where we uh, really uh, uh, kind of honor the thing as part of the worship. So I'm just wondering if uh, there is any uh, uh, part of reverence is being compromised or it, it's kind of difficult even for me to uh, think about that at all. Well, I'm desperately looking for a book, which I can't find now. I don't. I haven't organized my books yet. So, um, gracious, um, brother Timothy, you're familiar with uh, Swindoll's book, Grace Awakening. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, one of his chapters in that book, uh, I, I can't give the title of it, but. It's the dangerous nature of grace. Grace is always dangerous. Uh, yes, it can be transgressed. But, that, but shall I lessen grace so it's not so dangerous? Um, God is able to take care of his own people. The Lord Jesus, the head of the body, is able to take care of the health of his body. He will do that. Either I trust him or I don't. Um, and so uh, it, it, in Acts 2, they, they broke bread daily from house to house. So uh, that's the, the early church's practice doesn't have to become normative for us. But it appears to me that the breaking of bread is, uh, number one, a reference to the Lord's Supper. And number two... It's what people, what brothers and sisters did to, to acknowledge that this meal is in the presence of God and that we are servants of God and we are servants of one another. And so you break bread daily from house to house to express that. The apostles weren't running around to all these houses. You know, 3,000 believers on the first day. <laughs> They're not running around to all these houses officiating at the Lord's Supper. So who's doing it? Well, it's the people of the house. Yeah, I'm personally feeling, you, you can uh, share your thought also, but uh, I'm just thinking maybe if it is within the community, if the celebration is within the community, uh, maybe it, it gives us the boundaries that uh, are probably yes. required. 
uh, oh, there, than... Yeah, that raises an interesting issue. Um, if you have house churches, uh, normally speak, somebody told me in a recent trip to India in, in years past, and Sukumar uh, is, is uh, yeah, Sukumar Patnaik is still online here. Um, uh, it may have been with you that we were traveling through a town and someone in the car said, it used to be that we, we would be able to walk to church and it was just, it was in our neighborhood, but now we drive or, or we, we take a bus or something to go to the church. Um, if it's in the neighborhood, then you know who the believers are who are present. Yes? Yes. Yeah. And uh, furthermore, if the church is a healthy church and it's attractive to non-believers, you know when a non-believer is there. Yeah. The Lord's Supper, when you, when you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, should not be done just with a ritual in the night in which he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, you explain what the bread is. You tell the story. You explain what the blood is. You tell the story. And this non-believer sitting, everybody knows this is a non-believer who's there. Um, um, you invite to faith. And it might be that his first expression of faith is right there at the table. May I take part? And you will say, Are you, do you trust the work of Jesus that I've just explained? And the non-believer will say, yes. Then this will be the first expression of, um, faith. Faith. of faith that this person has. You will say, doesn't he have to be baptized first? Where is that in Scripture? I don't know where it is. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, it is not the convert's responsibility to be to seek baptism. It's the church's responsibility to baptize. Um, so Matthew 28, 19 and 20, baptizing them, not, not when they come seeking baptism, so you baptize them. Do, do you follow this? So... Yes. Um, so perhaps we would take the man out and baptize him immediately and then let him take part in the Lord's Supper. But, but the, the point is that, that it's, um, it may become, actually, the place for the first expression of faith uh, that this, this person's ever, ever done. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I am... Um, Sometimes it is difficult for me to uh, kind of digest this particular thought, even though yes. my theology pro uh, is straight in some way. But uh, practically, I, I do find difficulty because there are certain groups that are, uh, uh, like you said, if, if you believe in what is proclaimed, the story that you have just heard, uh, then that's fine. But if, if, if somebody is offering it uh, right in the... Uh, and right at the entrance, like a brochure, uh, if they are handing over the Lord's table without uh, explaining the meaning, right. I have a problem there. So uh, that's what is happening in certain settings, especially yes. in the yes. states. So yes. uh, that's what uh, causes me to worry whether uh, some form of communi uh, community uh, guidelines would help. Uh, in, uh, so, in, our doctrine of the Bible should be a guide to us. God never did anything without explaining it and typically explaining first what was going to happen. So uh, he didn't do the plagues before he explained what the plagues were going to mean in Egypt. See, yeah. so when we do the Lord's Supper, when we do baptism, we explain before what we do so that people who participate will understand it. Excellent. Uh, this is why I'm writing this book on the Lord's Supper. So we'll have a lot of different facets to look at and have different ways of explaining it. So go ahead, yeah. brother. You, uh, you're going to say. So it's, uh, you, for you to uh, kind of uh, be informed that Dr. Alman has actually written or writing a book on uh, the celebration of the Lord's uh, yeah. Supper. So uh, 
is not speaking out of uh, just uh, 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 just to answer the questions, but he's really really struggling with the text. So I just want to tell you that um, as a as a student of his. Uh, probably we'll close the day with uh, the final question from Brother Rufus, uh, as it's already nine uh, twenty eight here, but. Uh, I'm more concerned about Dr. Alman um, because he was, uh, he just mentioned about his sugar levels. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, Dr. Alman. Thank, 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 thank you very much for your uh, uh, inputs to us. I just wanted to, you know, I, I totally agree with uh, what all you have taught today. Uh, I just wanted to point out that there's a kind of a fear psychosis going on in church settings. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, pointing out or uh, trying to lovingly uh, correct some of the uh, doctrinal uh, mm. uh, misinterpretations or yes. things like that, because, uh, you know, basically it is all summed up as uh, thou shall not touch the anointed of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> that's where uh, there is a lot, lot of uh, a blockage uh, 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 going on because we are not able to have a smooth uh, kind of a, a, a relationship with the shepherd. So I wanted to know your comments as to, you know, because uh, I don't know about the other countries or the places, but basically I feel... In India, it's, we are more prone to be, you know, uh, controlled by this fear psychosis that, yes. you know, we might uh, get into trouble uh, if we are, you know, trying to question the anointed of the Lord. <laughs> so I kindly. Think, yeah, I thank you for bringing that up. That's, it's interesting. First time I was exposed to that idea was over 50 years ago. So it's, it's not new. It's been around quite a while. Um, yeah. uh, we have just seen that all the body of Christ is the anointed of the Lord. <laughs> and the elders are the servants of the body of Christ. <laughs> so they are not us unusually the anointed of the Lord. <laughs> they are the servants of the anointed. So, so that's just fundamentally flawed. It is contrary to the scriptures. It is man seeking honor and position and glory instead of, of seeking to be honored before God. We want to be honored before men and protected against men. Much of the corporate, um, the corporate structure that the church now has is aimed at protecting the church against its members. Instead, Jesus says, we got to protect the, the members against the leaders. Acts 20, 28, 29, 30, 31. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Alden. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, good good to see I you. Think we, yeah, I, I think we got a lot to chew for this week and probably <laughs> for months, actually. Uh, and, uh, and the good thing about the technology is you get to go back to the video again if you want to. Uh, we are trying to post the videos immediately uh, within the week uh, for your access. Um, so somebody has posted this helpful uh, uh, acknowledgement that uh, whatever Dr. Alman was pointing to was in chapter three of the Grace Awakening. And the yeah. title yeah. is "Isn't Grace Risky?" So that's the uh, probable yeah. chapter that the album was yes. referring to. Precisely, uh, thank you. Uh, mentioning about Chuck Swindoll's comments. So, so yeah, wonderful. Uh, thank you for being here. Keep <coughs> thinking and uh, standard disclaimer: uh, whatever we are hearing, uh, they are from a scholar who has done his study. Uh, don't take. Uh, don't try this at home is the standard disclaimer of some uh, people, but we are saying uh, don't, uh, uh, without digesting these thoughts and processing these thoughts for yourself and uh, reading uh, the scriptures, 
Now, please don't uh, outrightly borrow certain things and just dump on people. Uh, only when the convictions are formed after your own reading and once yes. you're convinced. Amen. Only Thank then please brother. take these things to uh, people out there. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think it would be of any help. So uh, yes. we don't want to disrupt the church. We want to build the church. So we want to be very careful in what we're doing. And if this is not our conviction and only you heard from Dr. Almond and you want to be his herald, then we are going nowhere. So <laughs> thank you. So yeah, please be mindful of that disclaimer. Always, always, always take uh, these great, wonderful principles, expository thoughts and, and make them your own uh, through the process of study. Thank you. Uh, just just thank a you word, for, just a word yes, building yes, on that. Dr. You are never obligated to believe anything I say. You are always obligated to test it by the scriptures, and then you're obligated to do what the scriptures teach. Yes. And, yes. and you you always say that, so I took liberty to just remind that. Thank you. Okay, yes. uh, so one announcement that is, uh, I we were planning to have some uh, hermeneutics uh, classes also, uh, which we wanted uh, to happen at a different time, uh, but Dr. Timothy Warren was uh, uh, kind enough to give some time, and it actually coincided with the classes that we are right uh, having right now. So we are very sorry for that. You mm -hmm. have to bear with us for two three weeks uh, of the schedule uh, because we we are trying to work around the schedules of the teachers. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, please bear with us. And uh, Dr. Uh, Timothy Warren will be teaching on Thursdays um, and it's our privilege to have two wonderful scholars teaching us twice in a week. So please grab the opportunity uh, and please let the others also know. Uh, there has been a criticism on what we are doing uh, in the 